Hey everybody, it's Rowan Dredge here. Welcome to Four Leaders TV. I am thrilled this afternoon to have a conversation with uh, two incredible operators. They've been uh, running their business together as a married couple for well over a decade, but they're also friends. And I think this is the kind of thing that uh, changes these sorts of conversations because you get a richness, you get a depth of uh, connection and and uh, respect in collaboration that comes out of that the nature of that relationship. But in addition to that, these two, Darren and Alison Hill, are thought leaders in their own right. They're influencers and contributors, not just to the marketplace, but to the wider conversation in leadership and behavioral management and motivation. And uh, their organization, Pragmatic Thinking, has been an incredible contribution to the marketplace. It's been one of the fastest growing uh, businesses of its kind for the last few years. The work that they do is outstanding. And uh, without any uh, delay, I want to bring Darren and Alison Hill into our conversation. Darren and Ali, how are you? Hey, Ro, we're great. Thanks I'm for so, having us here. I'm good, thanks, uh, uh, Rodney. Uh, Rowan, <laughs> right, right. it's nice right. to meet you. Been a long, long time fan, uh, first time, uh, uh, you know, contributor. Uh, you, you can tell we thanks practice. For, that's well, not not just that, but the whole the whole intro on the how we're friends and stuff is uh, is is really just been <laughs> yeah. just been yeah. del deliciously undone. So, um, <laughs> Rod, Rodney's my dad. I can get him on the line, but things might oh, go yeah. south. Oh, okay. Mate. All right, <laughs> mate. You're, you're like a two-star entree instead of a five-star main for Rodney. Let's bring Rod on. That's uh, yeah. we're not. We'll put it this way. I think if we did that, we would get a viral product for all. You know, for lots of different reasons. Uh, so uh, he was. Uh, Now's not the time to be talking no. about viral. Uh, yeah, he, Rowan. Oh dear. <laughs> He's, uh, he's quite the personality, my dad, but uh, he's the only one I've ever had, and I'm proud of him. So thanks for doing your research on my my family system there, uh, there Daz, and knowing that that was dad. Um, well, if you're still here, everybody, we're really glad that you're uh, you're sticking with us. Um, Darren and, uh, gosh, I've known about Darren and Ali for quite some time, but in the last couple of years, really got to uh, see uh, see what they're made of, and I think that's the... That's the key in life and leadership. It's actually seeing what people are made of, not just what we do or how we function or the work. Um, that's important, but what we're made of really matters. So um, perhaps, Alison, from the start, tell us a little bit of the pragmatic story and uh, and how you got to uh, where you are and what you're doing. Oh, uh, look, it's... um. Yeah, look, it's a great story. For Darren and I, we both have a background in psychology. So, yes, we're in business together. Yes, we are married. <laughs> we both uh, have a background in psychology, which most people kind of go, how does that work? Um, and and what happens when you guys fight, <laughs> which is always an interesting... Very quiet thing. fights, they are. <laughs> Very quiet. <laughs> it's usually because I'm right. That's, That's how right. that works. Right? Everyone steals the petty <laughs> cash and says, right, there's no That's more. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I think it's that fascination in both people, what makes people tick, but also both of us have a really strong pull to learning. Um, we crave it for ourselves. We love reading. We love stretching. We love growing. And in other, our kind of previous lives, uh, we had had, you know, similar kind of backgrounds in learning and development, running sessions, training, those sorts of things. And one of the things we saw was what we understood and were, were learning from a psychology point of view which often happens in a clinical setting behind closed doors, is really rich information that actually everyone should know, but specifically workplaces and leaders in workplaces who um, the majority of them, if not all of them, deal with people. And so whilst they have their task or their particular industry that they're working with, it's this nuance of you know, how do I engage people? How do we connect with people? How do I put out fires? How do I... Uh, have the conversations with people when they're not working or motivated or engaged in the work. Um, but how do I do it in a way that doesn't make them defensive or kind of put off? So we really saw this area and went, this is something we want to kind of bring to life. We were living up in Darwin at the time. Um, so started the business up there with a newborn baby like you do uh, on the kitchen table. We literally boxed up our television for three months uh, and wrote a program around courage, a program that to this day we've never sold. Uh, but it was that discipline of actually pulling together what we know from psychology, looking at what is practical and what is going to be relatable for leaders 
and and creating I guess a solution or some skills that people could step into that so that's really where it uh, was born from and then has kind of grown from there um, it was about four years after that that we moved from Darwin to the Gold Coast um, making every business mistake in the book but really arriving and um, you know, starting starting again in a lot of ways, but reconnecting with with why we do what we do, um, and and going from there in in a whole range of different industries in a whole range of different areas. Yeah, it's really fantastic just to hear a little bit about about those beginnings and days. I'll I'll get you to just make some comment on that as well. Just that what what it was like to actually unpack some of those uh, lessons along the way because you know people parachute into into your world right now and there's keynote speaking or a version of it these days and then various other sort of engagement and influence opportunities and so you know to hear you say every mistake in the book and I wrote a I wrote a program on courage that we never sold, which has got sort of an irony uh, in, to it as well, unless the program was for you and, uh, you know, <laughs> and, and it's enough to give you in, enough just to take take to market. But, and and then you obviously have two kids as well. Now, one of them's at high school. So, you know, you look back at that and go, wow, that's that's we've come a long way in that regard. So, Daz, what are your sort of reflections on those early days and, and kicking it off? Yeah, look, I mean, I, I think any good journey is a lot less about the pathway and the journey to take and more the belief of wanting to be on it in the first place. Uh, mm. It's like, like I think anything good that we ever enter, enter into in life, we don't do it based on around a, a net return slash uh, return on investment kind of mentality. I think that those things often are quite doomed. Um, so it's got to originate or come from just a deep sense of belief and, and a, a, a purpose or a calling to want to do it. And it's, it's even like our, our uh, relationship is that uh, when I proposed to Alison and, um, and asked her to be my life partner, I didn't ask her what things would look like in July of the seventh year of our marriage and where we'd be tracking and how we'd measure that success is you just kind of, you just have a belief that you want to do it and then you figure it out along the way. And, and so I'd love to tell you that our business success and, and, and our journey to this point was magnificently planned and that it was uh, because of our incredible strategic uh, <laughs> business minds and so on. But the truth is there's been, you know, good lashings of luck and plenty of hard work and some good timing here and there and I even look at that program around mm. courage as a skill we wrote it and um, truthfully it was probably five to ten years too early like we know with Brene Brown's work and stuff like that that um, that that's crashed through the sort of barriers where people will talk about vulnerability and courage and stuff like that it wasn't around back no. in the day but it'd probably be more palatable or acceptable now but that program was written for us that was funny when you look back on it in retrospect and go the program called courage is a skill well that's what we needed to leave safe yeah. dependable executive roles and go out on our own so and part of that's so true just in the way that that life and leadership works right what can you actually control or plan or or make happen and then what do you actually actually what do you need to develop the skills to be responsive to but be be strategically responsive to or you know wisely responsive to and i think i think one of the things you have been good at as a as a couple running a business is you actually have been good at seeing what how to pick up and language and package what might service the way that people interact and lead and engage with with each other in a way that's got a it's got a stickability to it, and I think, uh, and you learn that over time, don't you? You get you get better at it, and you makes more sense of it. And and um, like you said, luck and hard work um, they seem to uh, they seem to work together quite nicely. So, hmm. so yeah, I think. Go on, Ali. Yeah, one of the core things, and it's something. I mean, it's something I've, I've seen you do so exceptionally well, Ro. In that is the the ability to truly listen. Um, and so even with that, that program, Courage as a Skill, we took that to market. We had 12 meetings with heads of, um, you know, departments and, and kind of went, hey, here's what we've got. And they went, that's great. That looks amazing. 
and then proceeded to tell us all the things that kept them awake at night and what was going on for them and what initiatives they were trying to put forward. And, and, and that's where the juice comes from. And so that ability to, to truly go, oh, okay, well, let's get let go of this thing that actually we just spent three months pouring ourselves into um, to truly have that sense of just empathy and understanding and, and hearing the language. Um, and that, yeah, just requires that investment into, into those conversations. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And I think when an executive, a busy executive with lots of responsibility and the pressures coming from various directions, when they actually feel heard by somebody that wants to come into their world and help and add that kind of value and make those kind of changes, I, I think that's a, it's a refreshing experience. And the beauty in the work that we do is that it never goes away in the sense that people people are consistently needing help to understand themselves more. We're consistently needing help to understand how we can function more effectively. We're consistently needing help to sort of have the mirror and the window uh, shown to us. So. So fast forward, we're in the middle of a very interesting time in our world and, and Pragmatic's taken on some really significant changes, which we'll talk about. Um, what, what have you seen has worked well in terms of your own development and as business leaders, but also in the way that the business functions to market, perhaps pre uh, the, the COVID experience that we've got, what, what were you seeing people were needing, people were asking for, the things that were keeping leaders awake at night and um, obviously you respond to that. But what what did you notice and what did you see? So it, so was that when COVID kicked in? Pre-COVID, just as a, oh, just as a, a sort of a little bit of a, 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 brush, a brush stroke of the market. Yeah, look, I, we, we definitely, uh, we were actually about to launch a... Uh, a Kickstarter campaign and really throw a lot of energy and effort uh, behind. We we'd uh, developed up this beautiful book, um, and uh, with with twenty seven activities for teams, and it was all around a great team framework. So it was uh, as we we kind of um, as we've tried to understand culture in workplaces, and and culture is the most discussed, least understood topic on the planet. Um, but we'd kind of gone through this era of trying to homogenise all of our teams and and um, and have them all kind of uh, drink from the same bucket. Um, but the accounting team is very different to the sales team, and the sales team is very different to the production team, and so on and so on. And so, whilst we want them to belong to a culture, we've also got to let them have a sense of uniqueness around the team. So, uh, so we we been iterating and prototyping a program called the Great Team Framework for a couple of years. It was getting some stunning outcomes and success um, to help teams go to another level. And so we're really excited. Um, we were actually about two weeks away. Uh, we actually had some delays. We were planning on the start of March was going to be the launch of this Kickstarter campaign, this beautiful hardbound book. Um, we, we teed up people in various countries around the world and all sorts of stuff. I had this just a uh, really cool video that we'd shot and a bunch of stuff and then COVID landed, um, which meant uh, like our printing and stuff was compromised and and then the depth of COVID kicked in and we we pulled back from that. But that was that was a big area that we were specifically really seeing a lot of traction in with our clients was around how do we have individual teams within our organisation perform at an incredibly high level but still belong to the culture, not be lone wolf teams. And, um, yeah, so that was that was where we were spending a lot of time. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, I we had those conversations about the, um, you know, we're driving along in the car and you're just unpacking in detail what the uh, what the Kickstarter launch was going to be like and how this was actually going to accelerate the, the great team framework um, experience mm. as well. So it's crazy to think that that happened. And then, um, and, and, it, and it hit everybody pretty quickly. Like people in our in our world, um, it, it the the world around us changed really fast. And you said something, and you both might might want to comment on this. But you said something oh, about a month in. We were talking on the phone, and you said, "You know what, Ro? Um, Daz, you go. You know, leaders aren't finding themselves right now. You know, leaders are finding a way." And 
um, that to me was there's a handful of things that you sort of grab a uh, like a handle in a train or a piece of public transport. You grab a hold of it and you go, that one's going to help. Not just me, but it's going to help a whole lot of people. And what what's the how have you seen that idea, that concept, that principle actually help not just you, but people around you? Yeah, look, well, it was probably born out of just general observation. I guess it's one of the things that we're reasonably good at is is pattern recognition. Yeah, um, I guess it's part of the tool of the trade. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, if we can wind back, um, like I still remember the last conference that I did with a client was the 12th of March. Um, so I had their entire organisation. We had Adam Goods as a keynote speaker. It was a cracking day. And as the day went on, you could feel the news cycle starting to develop really, really um, aggressively to the point where the CEO actually closed the conference talking about what might be coming. And then, of course, the 13th was the big announcements. And then the 14th, 15th, 16th were kind of dates that were forged into my memory for a long time. <laughs> we'll that's, it, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> long time. We, we, we all will. Yeah. I yes. mean, for us personally, as business owners, we've seen a year's worth of work disappear in smoke. Um, because so much of the work that we did at that point was face-to-face. -face. Now, what I probably sensed or picked up on at the time, and I guess you have quite a unique experience of it being a business owner that has staff and, and employees who work for you, is uh, feeling the threat not just to the thing that you've built but to the team that you've assembled as well. And, and I, I noticed very sure. strongly within the first couple of weeks of COVID and lockdown and things like that, that there was this, there was this exhalation from the community where we, we'd been talking for ages, like I can't remember how many conferences I've been to where there's been a futurist or someone talking about the rate of change, how it's never been faster than before and then all of a sudden COVID said, hold my beer, uh, I'll show you how change can really happen. But um, there was this kind of narrative that went around on the socials where people went, ah, oh, this is the reset we needed. Ah, oh, thank God I'm loving this, that I've got this space at home. And I can tell you that our experience as business owners and as leaders was anything but that. So th there was no switch off. We were 24-70 we were trying to find a way. And that was... And guess, we were talking to other business leaders other than tourism who were yeah. just being... yeah slaughtered in terms of the end you yeah. know that that absolute sense of responsibility yeah. for families for uh for customers for the work in the pipeline with mm -hmm. with every lever that you normally have as a business owner that if you see a downturn you step up marketing you change your 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 product your service all of those levers were off the table uh so it's at least com compromise it had to rethink mm. them completely and so I guess that comment of that, that in times of crisis, leaders don't find themselves, they find a way, is that I, I guess it was part of it was born out of the narrative where people were just going, oh, I finally, this is the space I've been craving or that this is now our chance to reinvent ourselves. And our experience as leaders was anything but that. It was actually a sense of desperation and drive to find a way for our business, for ourselves and for our people because there was so much at stake in those early days that if we'd have went, yeah. well, let's take this as the time to contemplate ourselves and maybe look back on the last few years of what wasn't working and refresh ourselves, then we would have had a lot of people out of work and, and, and compromising their livelihoods, their families and so on. And so if I, if I could look at the genesis of that quote and where it come from, it was actually a counterpoint to what a lot of employees might have been experiencing or people with an employee mentality might have been experiencing. But a leader's mindset in crisis is you, you find a way through it because sitting in, in um, talking about how we're all feeling and empathising with people and doing that stuff, they're incredibly valuable and important. But no one's going to remember the leader who held your hand as you plummeted off the cliff but they'll remember the leader that steered you away from the cliff and so made decisions made decisions up. and it was a really up. interesting counterpoint to us because as you know Ro, we even in the leadership programs that we create the very first starting point is usually looking at who are you as a leader uh what, what are those areas you need to grow really kind of lifting the lid but that wasn't the time 
to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, for us, we love nothing more than creating that space, but it was a, a time we found for us, but also other business owners. And, and I guess, and I know you have the opportunity as well of connecting with people at very, very senior levels in, in corporate environments who, you know, where we were looking at a cliff, it's, it's exponential uh for that and it's and it's worn as a as something that you know key decision makers carry with them um and so we know people who find a way no matter what uh we get inspired by those and i think that was certainly part of when you are looking at 24 7 when you when you 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 really are searching for what's possible what do we need to change what do we need to make a call on now where do we need to invest what do we got to do for for the people around us and make the right decisions so that we come out this knowing that there is no sense of when this will end even now months later um yeah it was it was one of those kind of aha moments that even for us and True. it's lovely to hear that it connected for you but it was that reminder of oh this is what we're doing we're, we're just finding a way um, and we'll figure it out and we'll go down this path and, and if it's the right one, great. If it's kind of not quite right, but it's gonna, we're going to learn some something and if it's completely wrong, we'll know very quickly and we'll find another way. So it's the ultimate leadership bush bash, isn't it? You know, you're trying to figure out. We, we, know, we're, <laughs> we know essentially we've got to go in this direction, but we, when we go back and we look at, at the way we got there, it was uh, it was a lot sort of less refined than we thought. Um, someone's just popped in the comments here that your um, your response as people as and as pragmatic was um, was really fantastic, and it demonstrated your creativity and your agility. So getting a uh, an, a, a pat on the back there, which is really cool. Um, and again, you know, we we know each other. Uh, we, we we do work together and, um, you know, I've, I've delivered the, the Great Team Framework and it's a, appropriately named, I can say that. And, uh, and and so there's lots of other good things. But you, you shifted things very, very quickly into um, two big areas and they're the, they're the ones I, I really want to unpack with you in this conversation. The first is the, first is the, the, the shift to virtual and I'll say that because that's the one everybody sees. I think we see... Yes behind you is, is the new studio and various other other things. But the second is a little bit less public, but just as important, which is the shift to a distributed team. So if we started with virtual, um, what was the process and, and how did you get there? And then Alison, I'm going to get you to give us a little bit of a tour of the studio so people who yeah. are, are watching this video live or, or after the fact can see it as well. So but just tell us about that yeah. journey. You, you got to the point where you said, right, we have got to deliver down the camera now. This is what it's going to look like, what we're doing right now. Yeah. Yeah, I guess what we got a sense was that, um, and, and I guess it's it's part of any businesses you have to take risks. And for us, it was trying to get an estimate on what was likely going to be happening into the future. Uh, and for us, what we got the sense was that the risk of, setting ourselves up into virtual and virtual leadership far outweighed um, uh, or the upside outweighed the downside. So yeah. so we moved headlong into that space thinking it was going to be much more long term than what people were thinking. Um, we were lucky enough that we've run our business reasonably conservatively compared to, say, a San Fran startup uh, business that tends to run at uh, no profit and pump everything back in as we always tried to build a business that, that centred around old school principles around making a profit and so on. So we found ourselves in a position as, a, as an organisation to have some cash that we could utilise against, um, you know, the investment in, in setting up the equipment and so on for virtual leadership and studio. So, so that was our, our sense was that this was going to be around a lot longer than what people thought. So let's make the investment into it and that's where we went into it and we the the side point of that and i guess i'll get al to give a, a studio tour and in classic uh, live studio um senses i've had someone knock at the door so i'm going to really quickly go <laughs> and do that and leave al to take a <laughs> well I'll, it'll just be the it'll just be the rodney and allison show yeah that's right <laughs> whoever like that's you the are best comedy show around <laughs> that's right uh, so um, uh, before look, you take us through the studio um unless you need yeah. to go to the door as well and, uh, no no i'm all yours um, 
um, tell me a bit about the learning curve. I mean, because it's yeah. uh, it's it must be just so different and unique and incredible just to unpack a little bit about what it's like. Oh, it's huge. And um, I mean, that decision to go, look, this is where people are going to be connecting, interacting, um, wasn't a big one because obviously that's where everyone was having, you know, Zoom calls and meetings yeah. and catch-ups and, and connections. So, of course, that was going to happen. But I guess for us, even in a face-to-face, -face tra whether it's training or even running major events, we've always obsessed about the, the full experience. So what's the music that people have when they come on? What are the collaterals that are sitting in front of them that people actually want to touch because they look and they're, so, they're designed so exceptionally well? And so when we went to this platform, we, we started um, looking around and you start to look for leaders in the field. And we did start to see a few that were investing in this at a much higher level. So beyond just, you know, a laptop um, with a webcam, which is functional, but going, well, what, yeah, what can we do that actually brings that to this little screen here? And we've had a number of people even, even now say, can you actually engage people through virtual learning? And um, because, you know, is it possible? Is it, is, you know, what does that mean? Because it's, it's not as good as face to face. Um, and yet, I guess what sat in the back of my mind was that the screen is not the barrier because we spend hours and hours and hours and some of us pay really, really good money to watch the screen. And so that wasn't the barrier. It's actually about how do we connect? How do we engage? How do we change up the methodology of learning? How do we prepare people differently so that when they're sitting, how do they actually put things into place? So I guess the learning just started with that belief and it probably almost comes back to business is the belief that this is possible and then you just prototype. <laughs> you just try and we'll do this and we'll do this and we'll do this. So let me do, give you a bit of a tour. I'd love to see it. And that yeah. way you can see, see a couple of the different angles. And with that behavioural and motivation kind of mindset on, we are playing and starting to see that there is a few different ways that we can engage, tell stories or a different space that changes things up. So, um, so with that in mind, well, this, just... Just before you jump in there, Ali, so yeah. with that in mind, people people either watching this live or watching this afterwards, what you're actually looking at is the fit out of the new Pragmatic Studio, the virtual uh, studio, yes. and there's now a second one in production. So you're uh, you are really backing this, and uh, I've I've spent time in this in this office, and you've reimagined it. So uh, you've now uh, taken a turn to the left and uh, gone to a second camera. Take us through the virtual studio. This is great. Yeah. So yeah, <laughs> this is the. The studio and it is that investment in TV quality, so lighting, fit out, camera quality, um, and the second studio. Uh, we might have to have a catch up with you then because we've got a couple of other tech um, things that we're actually doing that will elevate that second studio even Great. further. So this camera and this space is really just our welcome space. So when we're starting sessions, it's often this opportunity to people get to see, but also just making sure that you've got everything you need, pen and piece of paper, glass of water, a cup of your favourite beverage, we're going to be kickstarting soon. Uh, so just a, really an opportunity for people to kind of have that warm welcome um, and connection into what we're about to do, whether that's a learning or whether it's actually getting groups groups of leaders together uh, to talk through what their next strategy is as well. Um, oh. This is kind of an area in our studio. So this is kind of the, uh, the, the, the main stage, so to speak. Uh, you'll see the screens behind us that, that have some branding around pragmatic thinking, what we can do. And again, a big part of what we do with clients is actually having things look and feel like their organisation because we find that that actually helps to embed the learning as well. This isn't just something we've taken off the shelf and it's kind of a nice thing, but this is actually part of who we are. So as a visual representation of that, we can actually put branding or the actual you know, program that we're running and change those screens. So that, that helps embed that, oh, this is, this is for us and this is here. Um, like I said, a bit of the main stage, this is our chance to kind of tell stories and really talk about kind of some of the big 
concepts from here. Um, the difference between this and television is, is it can directly ask you questions. So right behind this camera is where I can, you know, check in on chat functions and really get that level of engagement. Things like, and I'll even do it now, asking people on a scale of one to 10, where's your energy level at right now? So one is I haven't slept for four days. If I could have another five coffees, I might get through the next 10 minutes. And 10 is I'm absolutely bouncing off the walls. Just in the chat function, give us the number on a scale of one to 10 and that and you're getting real-time feedback as it goes and people yeah. are telling you what's yeah. going on and yeah and That's you also really changed were you, were you sitting in the first in the first uh the shot just before were you sitting yeah 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 so yeah. The, and then you stand the, just below okay. here yeah, there you go. Yeah, so okay. the opportunity to stand. So the other thing that changes is you, just the energy of presenter and the level of engagement, just even going from standing to, to sitting. Um, yeah. And this this shot over here is where I become the weather lady. So there's a there's a north, you know, <laughs> front coming through on the north. But again, yep. the, the, the opportunity to have slides or key concepts that we're talking through with um, with clients or through that learning capability but still maintaining eye contact and, and keeping engagement um, here but we can then shift to a more you know full screen so you can see that on go. screen so this is this is something else and we're talking through the COVID-19 motivation curve uh, so then you can interact between the presentation and having that on full screen um, and then the final one which is where we were sitting before uh, is coming back and, and again we're finding this is the chance to really not only change the energy in the session but ask key questions really kind he's of get back. a bit more uh, intimate so yeah he's back, I'm back. <laughs> yeah, it's been a bit of fun but yeah studio two uh, hopefully operational in the next three weeks or so where we're going to advance it uh, a fair bit uh, more because we won't as we won't be as restricted by um, we've done the best with what we've got um, and uh, and hopefully what will happen uh, in the next year because it's much bigger open space. We'll be able to do a bunch of funky stuff that we'll be able to show people what the next level is. So. Yeah, that's cool. And just for people watching mm -hmm. this either live or afterwards, you are able to book in for a studio tour. And so um, that's something that we'd be encouraging, encouraging you to do just to check how it fits yeah. your needs. I love it. I think Absolutely. you've just done a great job. Road. Go on, Alison. With that row, um, a lot of what we've been talking to people about is that we're kind of agnostic to platform. And so this setup, and we have now, I think, used it on pretty much every video conferencing platform, um, can function through that. So whether it's Zoom or Microsoft Teams or BlueJeans or WebEx, um, all of that capability. So again, with that TV, um, PTV studio tour, it gives you a chance to see it on, on the platform that you most use with inside your organisation. Yeah, that's great. I love it. At, at another level down, and this was the second sort of big idea I really wanted to unpack with you, is the is the more human element, which is the shift to a distributed team. And again, you pick up that leaders, they're not finding themselves, they're finding a way. And that that is really a, a modern way of making sense of what true servant leadership is about. Am I actually here for my own self-aggrandization or self-promotion or am I really here because I, I genuinely believe I've got responsibility to the people around me and to our clients that we serve. And you've also made the decision to, to be a distributed team. But again, the thing that I love ab about Darren and Alison Hill is you're not just doing it because you get a sense of it or it feels right. You actually have it backed by science, which is part of who Pragmatic is. And so if you're going to be a distributed team, you've thought about it and you're working it out and you're making it work. And so I'd love to hear about that process because everyone that watches this conversation is in some way, shape or form distributed. Um, why the decision? What are you learning? How's it going? Probably a combination of two major drivers, I reckon. One was... Uh, COVID and in the early days, everyone ISO'd, us, us included. Um, but we also faced that challenge of um, being such a, I, I guess some industries were more affected than others. So, for example, we're working with some manufacturing clients and they're having record years. Um, but for many, say, if you looked at tourism or live events or live training, <laughs> education, we've been just smashed. 
Um, so what we had had to do really early on was look at how we could reduce costs as a business um, because cash is the lifeblood of any business. If you don't have the money, you can't pay your bills. If you don't have the money, you can't pay your employees. So we had to go on a rapid cost reduction exercise. And so uh, we have two offices at PT, one, one in Brisbane and one in, on the Gold Coast. The Brisbane runs a really expensive office. And so that was one of the areas really early on that we said we're going to reduce costs. So that was one big driver. The second one, of course, was the, the isolation uh, factor that we had to figure out really quickly how we stayed a high performing team without being under the same roof. And I guess in some ways we were walking our talk in when we go and do face to face work with clients. We were a good face to face team like we, we had a lot of connection, very high touch. And so we try and live that product. And then, of course, when we're talking to clients about how to be an excellent distributed team, well, we couldn't be this co-located team and then preach from a pulpit that, we, that, that we'd never been behind. And so we, again, had the sense that distributed work was going to be around for a long time. And I, it, it wasn't just a decision to be a distributed team, Ro, it was actually to be an outstanding one. Mm. And there's a very different mm. mentality that comes with True. that is let's do distributed and let's just it'll do until we get back to normal. But we went, no, we're gonna, we're gonna be an excellent distributed team. And then like a part of our, our purpose as, a, as an organization and why we exist is that we, we wanna make work an extraordinary experience, this third of your life that you dedicate to a vocation um, is we want that to be an extraordinary experience, but we wanna role model cultural magnificence. So, so um, we don't want to be the plumber with a leaky tap. So, so in some ways, the move to distribute it actually gave a new sense of purpose to our team as well, where we said, if we're going to be distributed, let's do a damn good job of it. And so that's when we started to really unpack what are the behavioural drivers that are different to a co-located team, to a distributed one, what sort of foundations do you need in place and so on. And, and, and we tested those theories from effectively the 16th of March onwards. And we've looked at some of the OGs, you know, the originals in the space and how they've done that. And then we looked at others that weren't necessarily you know, global tech companies, because that's where most of the, the original uh, distributed teams came from. What about other areas? And, and so we've developed some philosophies and some beliefs and some systems around that that uh, are working really well for our team. Yeah, that's great. And Alison, one of the things I find that I've loved doing this when I've worked with you and in the same room and and uh, when we were able to do that. and uh, But also just in the conversation that we had in a team gathering just recently, you used this fantastic phrase and it's had a big uh, impact again. When you, when you find yourself repeating something to yourself, you know it was it was on the money, at least to you at that time. And you talk about um, rhythms, rituals Alton and artifacts. Alton just repeats those things to me. <laughs> so so I, I don't have to remember them myself because she keeps telling them to me. That's it. But you know where my brain's going, Ro? I'm like, did I, did I give you my lunch order? Like, where is are that, we going? Yeah. <laughs> what is this? But you say you say rhythms, rituals what, and what artifacts. recipe? Like, <laughs> Sorry, Hey, bro. Daz, you just said that out loud, mate, just so you know. Oh, no, no, don't worry. Uh, Alice, it's true. I'm Alice, a a terrible cook. Uh, Alison's birthday was on uh, Wednesday and it was the greatest day ever because she we went out for breakfast, went out for lunch, went out for tea. And so if Alison can never walk into the kitchen, she's the happiest woman on the face of the earth. Actually, everyone <laughs> else is as well, just quietly. <laughs> well done. Well done. And actually, I meant to make mention of your birthday. It's this week, so well done. Uh, and uh, I think... <laughs> I think you have been recorded as saying everybody gets to celebrate their birthday for a month or something like along those totally. lines. Totally, so, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> well done, well done. Rhythms, rituals and artefacts. Again, it's a, the reason why I resonate with it is because it goes, okay, these are the human sides of what we're doing. Mm. And if we're going yeah. to be a distributed team, because I think the distinction between what we're talking about here. And, it, and a lot of other people's experiences, well, we're remote now, put your camera on, uh, uh, you know, mute when 
the kids are yelling in the background. Uh, that may or may not yeah. be my experience um, this morning and uh, various other things. There's another layer to it. And that's what I want to hear a bit of you thinking about that, the rhythms, rituals and artifacts. What, why does it matter and what have you discovered and how are you experiencing it? Yeah, I think um, that push for the bigger purpose that Daz was just talking about, that we wanted to be an exceptional distributed team and let's just have that as something, um, a direction that we want to head in, a, a, an intention that we want to mm. set. Mm. Um, and a lot of organisations, when you say, you know, are, are your team working virtually or remotely or the word distributed, um, are saying, yes, yeah, they are. And they go down the logistics path. Does everyone have access to cameras? Webcams, you know, were hard to buy in office office works, those sorts of things. Let's get everyone those. Do they have access to printers? You know, how's their internet? Uh, do they have phones? Those sorts of things. And then they went down the path of operational rhythms. How often are we going to have Zoom sessions? Who's going to be on them? Those sorts of things. Um, and many have stopped there. Uh, I think that bigger purpose for us meant that we needed to go to that next layer and go well what's the what's the intention of those team get togethers what we, what do we want them to be um what what are we and not just trying to take what a co-located team has and and put that up so if there's posters in an office that we start to send people posters so they've got it around behind their desk like that's it had to be those more human things and I guess the essence of, of what culture is um, is those those rhythms those rituals and the, the artifacts um, and I had the great privilege of connecting with a mutual friend of ours uh, pretty early on and, and actually got to interview him on my podcast series Michael Henderson mm. who, who's a corporate anthropologist who you know if you want to know about culture he's the guy to go to um, and he he talked about, you know, in this shift that whatever that poster was on the wall, the conversation we need to have now is why is that important to us? What do we believe about that? And how do we bring that belief into what we do regardless of where we're located? And how can people really connect and buy into those beliefs? And so the rhythms and the rituals, the things we became very strategic around, um, it wasn't just appointments, the Zoom meetings in people's calendars. It was, well, what do we want to talk about when we get on Zoom? What What is our Monday rhythm going to be and what does Monday look like? And from a really practical point of view, Ro, I mean, a big part of this was taking the, the theory and the uh, research that we've had and put it into practice in a way that we, we talk about experimental prototype and, and, and see the downstream run of that. So we were having nine o'clock team catch-ups and found that, you know, people sort of either getting on eight or 8.30, starting some stuff but not really kind of getting into their day, then jumping onto a Zoom call about nine, and that might go for, depending on, you know, what we're talking about, it could go for an hour, um, so through to 10. And so you're getting to morning tea and not you haven't actually even got into your day. And so motivation, and motivation is one that, um, you know, the highs are really high and the lows are really low when you're working from home. And um, and so that was that was an interesting one that we started to see with our team. And so we shifted our, our morning catch-ups to 10 o'clock um, but did it with the intent and purpose and encouragement for everyone in the team to use that time before 10 o'clock. We want you to arrive and share with us with what has been your win this morning, whether it's been some peak productivity or that you feel like you've got out and done something that's energised you so that when you hit 10 o'clock, you're already into the day and the day is starting to win. Um, so, yeah, I think that's where those rhythms, rituals and artefacts, those essences of culture um, really need to have a, that, you know, that next layer of going, well, what's the intent here? What's the purpose? And then where's that collective shared experience that the team start to really buy into and celebrate now? Um, so we're definitely seeing that with our, with our team. Yeah, you've got a couple like win the morning and seize the midday are a, a couple that, uh, that that you run with. What are your comments on on that stuff, Daz? Oh, don't forget craft noon, which sometimes <laughs> turns into craft beer noon. Um, but uh, but yeah, no, they as Al sort of uh, hinted towards or talked about is that 
in a work from anywhere environment or a work from home environment, um, one of the things that we do tend to find, particularly on in the early days, is that it takes the caps off performance, um, off high performance in particular, because one of the big, I guess, roadblocks for high performance is interruption. So by being able to get immersed in the task, it, it, it gives you a better chance for flow state to turn up. So in the really early days of working from anywhere, everyone was going, oh, my God, I'm so productive. But the big challenge too is whilst we took the cap off our high performance, we also took the safety net away from low performance. And so when we had low energy days, you know, you're anything from hungover to tired from um, a rough night's sleep because of the kids or that kind of stuff. When you went into a, a co-located physical office, you had all these cues for your behaviour, like your starting hours, your desk, your meeting, uh, the water bubbler hour, these kind of things were, were all there to prop up our bad days. And when we took that away, work from home, we seen in the early days when people were in novelty and kind of early crisis response, amazing productivity levels. But equally, we've seen as people have gone on that their low days are really, really low. And it's that sense of ritual and belonging to a team that helps build that safety net underneath those really rough days. And we yeah. experienced those. We saw it across the team. They yeah. experienced those. So hence, really starting to bring into place some of those kind of rhythms around win the morning and having that as part of our kind of almost mantra or that sticky conversation. Um, and then the one you've alluded to, the C's, Seize the midday and our crafternoon. Crafternoon. <laughs> crafternoon. Thank you for clarifying that that relates to beer, Daz. I was uh, I was thinking well, we were, I was rushing myself yeah, back to macrame in, in, macrame in year seven. <laughs> I was like, no, macrame with Daz at four o'clock uh, on right. Friday. <laughs> that's right, quilting with Daz. Uh, <laughs> that's mm. it. That's it. So as we land this, like. Just look forward for a minute. What are you seeing sort of 6 to 12 to 18 months and what would you speak into just as we as we land this conversation? Oh, look, it's a marathon, not a sprint, the environment we've found ourselves in. Uh, I think it's quite clear with what's happening in Victoria at the moment. Um, I think that anyone who thinks that that'll be the end of breakouts and shutdowns and waves over the next 12 months is naive at best and, and ignorant at worst. Uh, I, I think that we know that we've got to adapt and, and, and find a way in business and, and as leaders of our teams to uh, work in distributed function and still perform. Like our society needs us to perform. Like there's, uh, whether we chose it or not, we live in a capitalist society that's dependent upon more macroeconomic drivers and so on. And it's really important for us in Australia or if there's people on this call that, that, that our economies are doing well because when economies don't do well, unfortunately, it's not necessarily the middle class or the upper class that um, that, that suffer. It's, a, it's sometimes people who are less fortunate. And so I think that there's a real sense upon all of us is to be highly productive in times of challenge and that's incumbent upon every team for us to be as productive as we can be. And we're going to learn really quickly how to do that when we're not under a roof together. Um, and I think that that's going to reshape the world of work forever. Like I think they're going to talk about this time, uh, the year of 2020 for a long time and how it was, it'll be alongside the printing press and other areas on how we change the face of work. And so I guess that comes down to leaders being able to shift their beliefs and their skill sets and their toolkits around how they lead. I, I guess the metaphor I'm using is that with socket sets, you have imperial socket sets and metric socket sets. And so what, as a kid, I'd kind of wouldn't really matter if I raided dad's toolbox and, and put an imperial on a metric nut, for example, and it would still work to the point where you applied significant pressure and then it'd slip. And if you keep doing that, what it'll do is it'll burr the nut and becomes unusable. And I think for many leaders in distributing uh, or working with distributed teams, my great concern is that they may be trying to use the wrong socket on the wrong nut. And if you keep doing that, every kind time you load. hit pressure, mm -hmm. it'll slip and it'll burr and it'll get to the point where it becomes unworkable. So making sure we've got the right tools for the job is gonna be really critical 
to have sustainable success in a very, very volatile market for the next couple of years. Yeah, critical yeah. role for leaders too. Alison? Yeah, I think there's definitely going to be that sense of um, just anticipating rolling rolling lockdowns or shutdowns. Um, and again, you know, I think as Darren said that we can't be looking at even Victoria or Melbourne in isolation that, that you know, it's that can happen at anywhere at any point in time. And so, um, and not to say that as a defeatist kind of thing, but more just to understand the, the opportunities that leaders need to step into. Um, and I think there will be this absolute duality on performance. How are we getting really clear on the things that need to get done today and where we might previously have looked at for a year or 12 month strategies, there needs to be strategy, but it might be the next 90 days. And what can we be delivered in that period of time? So I think those conversations become critical. Uh, the other ones that have always been there for leaders are those ones around, um, for want of a better word, mental well-being. But it's really leaders stepping into the conversations around uh, emotions and grief uh, and loss in this point in time. Because unless we be, can get to a point of accepting, and I mean acceptance in the term of active acceptance, the ability to actually just understand and realise that that is part of what's turning up, both for yourself as a leader, but also providing that safe space for your people, then again, we need to be able to have that, that container to talk about that uh, in order for performance to, to have a base to leap off. Because if we don't, it'll be using the wrong tool under a wrong pressure uh, situation. Oh, and mate, the other big thing is what we're going to need now is leaders of character, you know, and and to to um, I guess turn the camera back on you for a second is that you're just such a man of great character, Rowan, and you've actually been a real counterpoint for us in a in a time where we're we're just going off gut feel and hunches, and you're trying to figure it out when it's really difficult, and you you're on fast dial for us. Um, to to bounce off off someone who we consider to be of the highest character, and I think that that stuff has always been valuable, but it's in times of crises it's that it, that it becomes critical. And so, yeah. leadership character, and for anyone who's watching this, I'm sure they're they're as big a fan of your work as what we are. But it's it's people like you that we really need in this time to provide that that compass, that true north around what what leadership character looks like too. Yeah, thank you. Um, I appreciate that, and um, like the sentiments are, are, uh, are equal from from me back to Team Hill. Um, I was thinking as you were saying that, not realizing I was going to be an example here at the end. But I was thinking what a challenge it is to us as leaders and every leader ha it, it, tuning into this conversation. What is required of us over the next? 6, 12, 18, 24 months is a significantly deeper set of grounded skill sets that can navigate that incredible tension between the, the grieving the losses at one end and the and the healthy economy at the other and the, and the, the apparent dualism of that. That's And yet being able to navigate that and being able to be, um, as you said in a, a keynote a couple of years ago, uh, Darren, if you want to be a better leader, be a better human. And I wonder if I wonder if part of the invitation of what's going on in the world right now is all right, all right, fluff and bubble, put it to one side. Let's just be better humans, and let's 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 say say that. And and in the being of better humans, let let's express that in social media. Let's express that in our conversations. Let's express that to our clients. So, very very grateful for this conversation. Um, huge levels of respect for you, Megan, and I and the kids. Just uh, got a lot of time for Team Hill. People wanting to contact you and us at Pragmatic, what do they got to do? Oh, we're on all the all the places. So Pragmatic Thinking. <laughs> You're everywhere. Website. We're on uh, LinkedIn. Um, so yeah, LinkedIn's probably where you know a lot of the business kind of conversations, and particularly these kind of leadership conversations. Yeah. But yeah, Pragmatic Thinking on on, on Facebook, um, on Instagram. YouTube, <laughs> so yeah, on all the places, and then yeah, Darren and myself as well. Yeah, uh, fantastic. 
at Bolter Brewery at about three <laughs> o'clock this afternoon. Crafternoon. Uh, Crafternoon <laughs> kicking in. So, yeah, we're wherever, like all the way around. So. <laughs> we're at all the places we're supposed to be on Friday afternoons. If you've uh, got value out of this, put put a note in the comments. But thanks, Darren and Ali. We really appreciate it. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Ray. Thanks, Ray. thanks for being you, mate. Yeah. Gotcha. Just, uh,